my background's been in branding and marketing all my working life. And um, I've worked with mega businesses and also with micro businesses. So I've been able to observe how companies deal with their clients, their reputations. And it's been interesting over the years. Um, um, I've also co-authored, I'm far too lazy to write a whole book, but I have co-authored uh, several business books, about five uh, Amazon bestsellers. Uh, what else? Oh, and I'm a member of loads of things and whatever. So that's a little about m my background. I've been doing it for a very long time. So it's never too early to build a, reput a stronger reputation. And I know I'm talking to people, grown-ups who know what they're talking about. So I'll try not to be too 101 about this. Um, but really, if it's a founder, they have to be thinking about the reputation right from the start. Um, and there's a difference between brand and reputation because brand is our outward facing, the customer facing uh, part of our business. It's um, our logos, our icons, our uh, strap lines, the whole way that our customers experience us, how they associate our brand with our product or service and how we stand out, whereas reputation is much more about our ethics and values, how we uh, deal with all our stakeholders and how they review what we um, do, what our teams uh, and we say. So it's right from the start. It's even from the way someone answers the phone. If you've got a certain value and ethic in your business that you want to um, uh, illustrate, you want your uh, to to engage with your customers in a certain way, then it has to be right from the first moment of contact. So, and this is a, a insight that I thought I would share with you. It's quite recent. Um, it's a survey that Deloitte and Forbes did together. And these are how a good reputation can improve our, our um, positioning. So 85% of customers apparently rely on online reviews when they make uh, purchasing decisions. 87% cross shop every, I, I, this, I know because I do this, I'm sure you all do it too. Um, a good reputation helps us to retain our customers. 70% of customers whose complaint, complaints are resolved will do business with you again. Um, obviously people don't want to work with a company that's got a bad reputation. And it also helps in terms of, um, how our company is protected from risk. We, we have a good brand reputation, then our strategic risk is going to be um, much, much better controlled uh, when we have a um, crisis, anything like that. If our executives are on side, then it's going to be protected. So these are things to con consider. Uh, again, I'm very aware that most of you have been running businesses for many years, so, but, I, I think you have to start with what you believe in. Why did you find your business? What is your vision? What are your goals and your values? How do you plan to achieve them? Who are your customers? What are their values? Because obviously you want to engage with people with similar values or at least understand what their values are so that you can respond appropriately. And what about your team, all your stakeholders? So your directors, your investors, your NEDs. You want people on board with the same values and ethics. So I'm not talking about me too necessarily, but I'm certainly talking about people who share your values and also then how you're going to communicate all of this. So I'll go through it all again, because I think this is the most important aspect of setting up your reputation. So um, then there are ways in which your reputation can be uh, communicated. And one is of course, with slogans. So you'll know these, and I'm very happy for you to shout out if you want to. Um, Who's that? Anybody? m &S, Never Knowingly Undersold, John Lewis. Every Little Helps, Tesco. Should have gone to Specsavers because I'm worth it, L'Oreal. And it does exactly what it says on the tin. So there we go. Um, these messages align your reputation with your brand. And you should always try and be honest, transparent, authentic, be accessible, communicate properly and promptly, lead by example, and again, ensuring that your company ethos is incorporated across the board. And don't forget that this, imply, uh, this applies to induction right at the beginning when you bring people on board. 
Um, I've just been working with a client who's um, they've had someone working with them for nine years and they we've done the values and ethos years ago and we thought everybody was fully on board. This person had been using the um, her business phone for inappropriate uh, inappropriately and it had cost the company quite a bit of money and she was at um, she was just being trained to be their HR manager. Sadly, they had to sack her. She didn't understand why. She didn't understand that inappropriate use was a sackable offence. So um, what can go wrong? Well, social media, using social media in, inappropriately, not responding properly on social media, um, fighting with your um, customers, uh, on uh, disagreeing with their posts. There's a whole range of stuff that can go wrong on social media. Employees, as I've just mentioned, not there. Oops, sorry, folks. Got his head of myself. Um, everything around this is going to impact on your reputation. And I'll give you some examples of what can go wrong. So um, Patagonia, it's a brilliant business. They've been going for 50 years and uh, always with the same ethos. And I'm, I'm just going to refer to my notes now, so don't make any, don't make any mistakes. But the owner of Patagonia had decided to retire and he has um, split his company and set up a foundation so that a, I think it's 2% of profits go into this foundation. And this foundation is then used for envir environmental purposes and helps to support charities in that space because Patagonia is all about the outdoors and outdoor um, equipment. Uber, oh, I'll do Nike next, Nike. Nike is brilliant. They, they have a huge team of online specialists who deal with all their uh, social media. So they respond very quickly and appropriately, appropriately to any um, messages that are um, negative, uh, positive, it doesn't matter. They really respond well. So they keep that focus on the reputation through their social media. Um, who else? United Airlines. I don't know if you remember, about a couple of years ago, United Airlines had this horrible situation where they pulled someone off the plane and it all went viral. They responded very badly to it. And as a consequence, their share price went down and so did the bookings. You have to really be careful. Chase Manhattan had a ridiculous ad. Uh, and here's something to think about. Always question your agency's ideas because some of them are crap. And if you're not careful, especially if you're using a big agency, you get drawn into this and you think, well, they're creative. They know what they're talking about. They don't always know what they're talking about. And sometimes their ideas are ridiculous. And in this case, with Chase Manhattan, sorry, I'm getting a bit excited because it's advertising. But in this case, Chase Manhattan had an ad, uh, it was, I believe it's online, where they, they um, had this avatar of their client of their customer, but it was really negative. It was all about someone who couldn't handle their money and they they ridiculed this situation. Well, you know, a lot of us can't handle our money and we don't want our bank telling us we're rubbish. We want our bank to help us to handle it better. And if you look at some of the current bank ads, I think Barclays is one of them. They're really brilliant at saying they'll support customers, especially new customers, young customers. and. It's it's really important to question any um, advice you're given in terms of promoting and uh, engaging with your clients. So um, Uber, Uber has had years of bad um, press. In fact, there was six years where there was only ten days. With I think it was up until about 2018, where there were just ten days in six years where they didn't get any bad press. Um, and it was all about the way they handled their staff. Um, I, and some of you may remember it. The, um, but it hasn't affected their business because they've got a great product. The app works brilliantly and cust customers can be very forgiving if you've got a great product, but it, it may not last forever. So it's always wise to, to just look at how you're dealing in terms of your reputation. For instance, Amy's Baking, I don't know if people watch any of the Gordon Ramsay programs, but Amy's Baking Company was a program, uh, a company chosen by Gordon Ramsay 
on uh, one of his, um, I think it was one of his worst nightmare programs. And um, they argue with customers. They argued with Ramsey. In fact, Ramsey washed his hands of them. And that company eventually went under because they weren't providing their customers with what they wanted. They were telling their customers they knew better and this is what you want. So just some horror stories. So some of the reputation do's and don'ts, um, check your social media channels. You've always got to be honest and authentic. You've always got to respond promptly, empathet empathetically and transparently. Um, authenticity builds trust, obviously. The more honest you are, the more you engage and are accessible with your customers, the more they're going to trust you. Listen to what they're saying. Any, any questions around um, poor feedback, bad service, anything like that, take it offline. Or take it offline as fast as you can because that's where you should be dealing with it. Um, these are all obvious. Reputation don'ts, again, these are all obvious. obvious. Your customers' concerns, um, never minimize them on social media. You never min minimize them anyway. You should just deal with them, find out what the problem is. Um, don't ever ignore negative feedback and complaints. I mean, if we go to a restaurant and the food and the service is poor, we're going to put something up on social media. Highly likely we're not going to go there again. Um, so if we tell them in the restaurant that we're unhappy and they look after us, we're more likely to say something nice about them. So, so there we go. Don't shut down your audience. Never, ever, ever buy fake likes and reviews. It'll all come out in the wash. Um, a lot of this stuff may take a while, but a lot of stuff comes back to bite us in the bum. So um, again, we were talking about automated responses for um, chasing up money earlier. And I thought about this then because um, really, I think and one or two of us touched on it. It's really better to have a human touch in this case because um, people deal with people, don't they? So um, again, this fighting with your customers thing, don't, ver don't overreact, don't respond ne negatively and to, uh, don't defend your uh, negative uh, feedback, respond more appropriately. Uh, it's a big one, leaving incoming messages unanswered for a long time. And one or two people have mentioned that today as well. That's a huge one, isn't it? Don't lie about your finances and operational misconduct. This is really for corporates, but I think if we start the way we mean to go on with our businesses, then it's not gonna hurt us. So um, don't hide anything. Um, it's something which comes up in crisis communications. You've got to be honest right from the start. Um, some media tips, which again, a lot of you will know, um, but when you're dealing with the media, it's easy to be misquoted. So find out what the rules are. Be certain of any deadlines. If uh, someone wants to interview you online, be prepared in advance, ask for the questions, um, always tell the truth. So if it's something you don't want to talk about, simply tell them, I can't talk about this at the moment, but I'll get back to you if you're going to get back to them. Um, it's far better to be honest because they will um, deal with you. Uh, more fairly in there in, as well. So absolutely don't say no comment. It's a red rag to a bull. People are going to want to know why you're not commenting. And if you can avoid jargons and acronyms, because people, we all know our businesses really well. We know our market sectors. Doesn't mean that the press does, especially the local press. So you need to explain things. Think about what you're saying. Um, don't ramble, don't wing it. And practice, 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 practice. Um, before you before you speak to the press, as I say, if you've asked for um, questions in advance, then you can actually think about what how you're going to answer them. Remember, this is all about reputation, so you want to uh, protect your reputation. But if there have been some issues where things have gone wrong, then just be honest about it. Explain as best as you can what's happened and how you're dealing with it and have a crisis response plan in place. 
because you never know when things are going to go wrong. I know we're not big businesses, but things still can go wrong and quite dramatically sometimes. So think in terms of the different stages of a crisis. So there'll be the initial stage when some it blows up in our faces. I think someone told me about, uh, not on this platform, but um, I was talking to someone recently and he was putting together an event with Range Rover and I think it was a British Horse Society or something like that. And a Range Rover killed a horse or damaged a horse so badly it had to be killed. So that's the initial crisis. So how are you going to deal with that? I mean, to begin with, with there's panic all round and there are two clients there, both of them panicking and asking this event manager what he's going to do. And it's all going to reach a crisis. You've got to plan how you're going to deal with the press, how you're going to deal with your customers. Um, have you got what have you got in place? What about the legals? Just have everything in place. And then slowly it'll all unfold and we'll get back to normal. But there are these stages in, in crisis that have to be dealt with and you have to think through it. And if you have a plan in place, it just makes everything easier. So um, again, you guys know all about this. There's loads of support out there um, to help you to develop your reputation, your brand reputation. All of these people, um, they're just fabulous. If you can get some great ones, and I know there's some great ones on this um, platform. So there you go. That's me, done. So, okay. I now have this sharing. Yeah, we'll take that one down. Uh, Sandy, that was fantastic. There's a lot to this, um, and I know um, a lot of what you said this morning um, crosses over with what Dan Pratt uh, does at CX Consulting. And I'd like you two to put your heads together if you don't haven't done already. Uh, no, that would no. be a very, very good uh, intro. Thank Any you. questions uh, from anyone this morning on this? Dan? Uh, yeah, firstly, I just wanted to reiterate what Ollie just said. I thought that was incredible. And um, as a CX consultant, and uh, I run a customer experience consultancy company, um, a lot of that resonated with me. And it's something I truly believe in. And it's very refreshing to hear that from a from a different perspective. And um, I think they were incredible words of wisdom. So um, I'll send you a LinkedIn um, request. Thanks. And it'd be great to catch up for a virtual coffee, I think. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to say um, great presentation. Thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, some really good facts and figures in there as well, which uh, hits home with people. So yeah, thank you. Yeah. Well, I, I didn't give you all the, um, the the examples because it would have taken ages, but you can always go online and look at how people deal with their issues. and. I'm sure learn and do better. <laughs> An interesting fact as, as well, which um, you touched upon is that about complaints and how 85% of people will return if their complaint is handled well. Um, there's also a fact that if a complaint is handled well, the MPS score for that brand is actually higher than if they just had a normal experience. So the recovery is actually a promotion of your brand as well. And uh, by offering that insurance and recovery methods can improve your, your brand perception. So yeah, I really liked that, that point. Well, when I was looking at Uber, um, I think it was in 2022, their brand um, recognition factor had gone down by, oh uh, no, brand reputation factor had gone down by minus, it was minus 23. And yet people still use the product because it's a great product and it works. Mm. So yeah, it's interesting. So, sorry. Thanks, Dan. Quick, quick question from me, uh, Sandy. Um, am I right that you you said that Starbucks was one of those brands that had a good reputation? In um, I didn't use uh, that example here because I was um, catching up with the work that I'd done earlier because this was an I'd done this a month ago this uh, um, uh, presentation so I wanted to just check it and the information I was using then was the fact that they will if people complain they will give them a, a free drink. But their reputation has taken a bit of a hit recently, so I haven't used them as a didn't open that one up. So. Thanks, uh, Sandy. Louisa. Hi. Um, I, I missed the first like five minutes, but I, I think I got the, the nuts and bolts of it, which is fascinating. Um, I have a kind of a very specific question to startups, and that is that obviously there are an awful lot of plate spinning within early stage businesses, and sometimes the way that you're dealing with customers 
is or the efficacy of the things that you're giving to your customers are impacted by quite significant external factors, like, for example, slow moving investors. How much transparency do you think businesses should give to their loyal customers around the external challenges that might have an impact on the quality of the service they deliver, but ostensibly they can't do anything about immediately? Well, I wouldn't talk necessarily talk about the investment side of things, but um, there are a load of factors that do impact. I mean, one of my clients works with um, Virgin Plastic, and that's a huge negative these days. But there's a lot you can do around that. And what they're doing is, um, so they're not an early stage business. They've been going 11 years. But um, what they're doing is going for B Corp. So they're looking at all the ways they can genuinely, not greenwashing, but genuinely develop their sustainability profile. Offset that product, uh, that plastic use. But unfortunately, it's key to their manufacturing processes. So, so I think you can be honest and say, yep, yeah, so I understand the world is hates plastic and we need to do something about it. But in the meantime, this is what we're doing. So I don't know if that's helpful in terms of sometimes it could be the supply chain and I have to I'm looking for a better supply chain. But at the moment, this is what we're doing. So you're, you're explaining that you recognize the issue. And you are working to change it. But you have to do that. I mean, Nestle lied about the fact that they were using unsustainable plant palm oil and people found out, of course, they did. So um, you have to be genuine. It's not just a case of putting up some sort of smoke screen around the issue. But you don't have to tell them everything. Just work out the narrative and um, decide, you know. Cool. What's Thank right. you. Thank you. Thanks, Louisa. Um, any final questions uh, for Sandy while she's with us this morning? I think we're, um... oh, go on, Neil. You're on mute, mate. Yeah, no, I couldn't find the button, so I just used the real one. Um, um, no, I was just, I was just wondering. It was a, a, a debate I was I was um, hearing a lot last week uh, about automation and so much about complaints and feedback, especially for these larger companies, go through automated chatbots or all these kind of stuff. I mean, how much are you finding or encouraging? Um, customers to you know when dealing with this with this issue because you know sort of so much of the servicing is um is is automated nowadays and complaints is obviously you know the easiest one because people might just go away if the complaints procedure is a little bit painful i absolutely hate it as a customer i hate it i hate my bank's chat boxes they don't work because they can't answer all the questions we have because we're human beings mm. and there's all sorts of you know, um, levels in our complaint, all sorts of nuances. So I end up phoning and being a pain in the ass because that's the only way I'll get answers. Mm -hmm. um, that's And I think for smaller business, it's even more imperative that we, I know it saves time, um, but it could lose us business. So my instinct is to go with the human response. That's, I'd like to link with you, by the way. Oh, me, me too, me too, definitely. <laughs> we will do that. Um, yeah, actually, just just a, a, this is a funny analogy that was used at, um, uh, at, at the conference I was at is they described a chatbot or a large language model like having a cat and then it brings home a dead mouse and looks at you and says it kind of like wants to be uh, thanked for that because that's the level of kind of quality that it returns. So I'm just, unfortunately, I've got pictures of my of the cat I used to have when I was young, bringing back a dead mouse and thinking, right, that's every chatbot I know nowadays. <laughs> they might, they, I mean, let's be honest, AI is improving all the time. I mean, it's constantly changing i don't know whether it will reach a level there's people here who've got much more uh understanding of this than i have but my research has said that it might reach a level where it can't learn anymore but maybe i'm wrong that that most of the new generations are are beginning to pan out but i don't know so, so i'm done <laughs> all right neil that was uh great and thank you very much all for your your questions and thank you again to uh sandy um you're going to get a lot of love and big ups today sandy on linkedin <laughs> and other um social media 
places. So um, get ready for that. Thank you.